So as you realize that for those, I think most people have been here since Sunday. Today's our third time. We are looking at the topic of knowing the time, knowing the time. Um, on Sunday, we dealt with Romans chapter 13, verse 11, and, and we are to know the time. It's a phrase there. And then yesterday, we covered 2 Timothy chapter 3. These are perilous times. Back in Sunday, we talked about the fact that we need to awake from sleep, and we went through that in some detail. But today, our brother Mark Harris is going to lead us, and he is going to cover the theme of time to care. So we're going to turn it over to our brother Mark. One other point. Uh, we said the other day that if you do have questions, um, we don't have a box as far as I can see. But if you do have questions, please write them up on a little note that we can read and put it at the, on, the, on the table here. We will uh, uh, attempt to address those questions. But we encourage you, if you really have questions, please bring them forward. We really want to be able to help. Over to Brother Mark. So the song we just sang is very helpful in our study today because what we're going to look at is, we call it a time to care, but it's one of the times in which we're not seen, it's not seen as a warning as we've had so far, it's seen as a word of encouragement. It's a word of encouragement to the people that Peter was writing. So I'm going to ask someone to turn to the text, and that's 1 Peter chapter 4, and to read from verse 7 through 10. Someone read from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Let's not all read at the same time. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Verse 9. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as the stewards of the manifold grace of God. Thank you. So the key phrase that we're looking at is the end of all things is at hand. Later on in, I think, the second epistle, it's a very similar phrase, except that one is to help us stay, you know, wean ourselves from being connected with the things that are going to be destroyed. I want to give you a little background of the text of the, the book and to show what this end of all times might suggest. Peter is writing to believers who are being persecuted on account of their faith in Christ. These believers were scattered. They had dispersed, left Jerusalem, went to all different parts in different counties, and spread the gospel, and as a result of spreading the gospel, as a result of the gospel, their lifestyle as a result of the gospel was so dramatically different from the lifestyle of the day. In fact, it was so different that it got its own name. It was called The Way. When people saw these group of people who were followers of Christ, there was something completely distinct about them. But it wasn't something that was distinct that caused them to be admired. It was something distinct that caused them to be the object of rejection, persecution, and suffering. And so this whole letter is really Paul, Peter's two letters are really to encourage believers because we are not in the place that we are going to. We, in chapter 1, he tells us that you are being preserved for an inheritance reserved in heaven. So while you're here, things are not going to be very easy. In fact, in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, 
arm yourselves with the same mind. What is it? To be prepared that in this world that rejected Christ, that you are going to be rejected as well. And so this is the setting of this passage. And so when he tells us what time is it, he says, endure, because it, we're in, we are in the passage of time. What happens is you were unbelievers, the gospel reached you, and you were transformed and changed, and that's where you are now, living to the glory of God, but you're now suffering. But you know what? It's transitory. It's only for a period of time. And what we want to look at today is during this period of time, first of all, we want to look at the fact that living for Christ, and we touched on this a little bit yesterday, will, in fact, incur persecution. Jesus said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. So we have to appreciate that this is what we're called. We are called not only to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but to suffer. Now, we don't know a lot about that here in North America, in Europe. We know very little about it. We have brethren in other parts of the world that experience it in, in very real terms, in very real terms, hostility, unemployment, um, un, unable to do some of the basic things that we take for granted because they identify themselves as followers of Jesus Christ. And so we may not feel the pressure that Peter's audience would feel, but I want us to think about this because it says, arm yourselves with this mind. It's coming. It's coming to North America. It's coming to America specifically. It's already in parts of Canada. I've read reports that it's already incidents where things happened already, where people are being arrested for preaching on the street and being accused of hate speech. And so we have to be, to, to follow verse one in chapter four, arm ourselves. Let's get ready to be aware of the fact that this is our potentially common experience that we're going to have. It's God's providence that we haven't experienced it and we ought to thank him and we ought to be uh, appreciative that we haven't had to be tested the way the brethren that Peter is writing to were tested. But it's an important reality for us is that the time is coming that we might have to experience it for real. And so we wanna go through this. Uh, just a couple more comments and I'll let someone jump in. In chapter two of First Peter, he talks about suffering for conscience sake, meaning that God has pricked your conscience and your conscience and you're going to live a specific way and everyone's gonna look at you and say, <laughs> why are you doing that? And it says, because you live before an audience of one, you live and have to answer to the living God. In chapter three, verse 14, it talks about suffering for righteousness sake, that everyone is doing what's right in his own eyes and you are deciding and with the Lord's help, wanting to do what's right by a divine standard. And then he says in, in, in verse three, uh, chapter three, verse 17, you could suffer for just doing well, doing what's good, helping your fellow man and, and helping the one who is disenfranchised and aligning with those who are the off cast of society. And what will happen? He says, they're going to look at you and they're going to say, what is wrong with you? Why are you doing this? Why is this something that is of importance for you? And then in, in chapter four, past our text, he talks about us being reproached for the name of Christ. And then in verse 16, suffering as a Christian, modeling and living in such a way that your life mirrors and, re, and is a, uh, a small replica of the life of Christ. And so he says here, this is our world that we're living in is that they're going to make fun of you. They're going to scoff at you. They're going to make, you know, you know, treat you as if you're some outcast because you're not doing what they're doing. You're living according to a whole different model, a whole different standard because of the gospel.
I saw Tim move, and so I stopped, and then he stopped. Sometimes when we have been um, active for a while, we're very tired at the end. But there are other circumstances when nearing the end is the time for more effort. Mm. And when um, somebody is uh, a runner, for example, and it's a, a, a race, not a, not a dash, but a, a longer race, they save something for the end. A long swimming race, they save something for the end. The, uh, the anchor leg of a relay, you put the strong runner uh, as the anchor, the fourth of four runners. And I would suggest this is the, the, um, the atmosphere of verse 7. I think, to, to realize that the end of all things is at hand, it doesn't mean, oh, finally, we can, you know, soon we can take it easy. It, it's, a, it's the opposite context. The end of all things is at hand. This is really the time to be serious, mm -hmm. to run with even more intention, to, to be pursuing what is true with even more uh, vigor or with even more awareness of the atmosphere um, you know that's around us that for the runner and just to realize that this is the the context here the end of all things is at hand therefore it really matters it, it always has mattered how Christians live but it really matters when the end of all things is at hand just to add that to the introduction about um, knowing the time Just a quick comment about the um, realization that we are going to be targeted to some extent. And this is, I think, in the King James. If you look in chapter 2, uh, it speaks in verse 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And I think that the King James says something like a peculiar people, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, a peculiar people. The, the comment I want to make is that we don't want to get persecution because we are peculiar people in the sense that just being difficult mm -hmm. and being peculiar. I don't think that's not what we mean. We mean obviously that, in fact, other translations say a people for his own possession. But I would just want to make that point that God does not want us to bring on difficulties upon ourselves by simply being difficult people. <laughs> Obviously, we are talking about if we are faithful to the Lord Jesus, then there will be traits and, and the, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives will convict others. And that, that's a different story. I just want to make that point. Just, just to add to that, that word that's used in verse 9 of chapter 2, it's an interesting word. It, it has the idea of being erected or built uh, like a memorial that's there. It has special purpose and special meaning. And it's, it's to be there for uh, a testimony. It's to be there for where his own, the New King James says, his own special people. And it gives the idea that we are, we are in this world for a purpose. And we're not just here. And, it, and the purpose is, and I like the translation that says, my, my New King James says, to proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. But another translation says that we proclaim the excellencies of him. Mm -hmm. and, and that really sets it well, I think. But the other thing I want to want to just mention here in our text in chapter 4, verse 7, where Mark brought us to, but the end of all things is at hand, therefore be, be sober, be serious and watchful in your prayers. This is the second of three times that Peter uses this word sober here in, in this chap in this book. And I think it's significant just to maybe give them to us. Um, in chapter uh, one, we read in verse 13, therefore gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's the idea of girding up for action. 
Uh, so your minds are being girded up. You know, it's back in the day, we, we know very little about this idea of girding up because we wear pants and not skirts. If, if you ladies have a better idea of what this means than we do, but when back in the day, they would gird themselves up. They would tie up their, their robe or their clothing so that they could run, so that they could get into action. Mm. This is the idea. I'm not suggesting, men, that you wear skirts so that you <laughs> can fulfill this. I'm not suggesting that. But, but I am saying that this is, this is the attitude uh, that needs to happen in the mind. It, 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 uh, my mind needs to be prepared it's a sober attitude of readiness. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you have in chapter one, this idea of sober. It's, it's, a, it's an attitude of readiness. But here in this chapter, what we're looking at here, it's not so much an attitude of readiness as much as it is an attitude of reality. Mm. That, that, and I think uh, Brother Sam just alluded to it, uh, that this is the reality that we're living in. This is it right here. We're there. And it says, uh, therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. You need to have this attitude of uh, this sober doesn't mean sobriety. Uh, it doesn't mean not drunk. Uh, but it's sober means uh, to, to be serious minded. It doesn't mean that you have to walk around looking like you've been sucking on lemons. It, it, that's not the kind of sober it, it, what it does mean is that you take the things of God serious and that you're living in a day when you know the rest of the world doesn't, but you are. That's what it means. It's an attitude of reality. I live in this world and I need to prepare my mind for living in this world. And, and then the, just to mention this, the third place where this idea of sober is mentioned is over in chapter 5, verse in verse 8, where just to connect it, humble yourself, verse 6, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, uh, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking he, whom he may devour. Here, it's an attitude of, 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 of clearness. It's an attitude of, I, I, I'm, I'm not being fooled by the, by the ways of the enemy. I know that I have an enemy. And this is what Brother Mark brought us to at the very outset, that we're to arm ourselves. Well, why? Because we're in a battle. Why? Because we have an adversary. And he's going about like a roaring lion. But just one more thing about this, because each of these things have to do with the mind. Be, be ready in your attitude. Be ready in reality. Uh, uh, have an attitude of, of knowing where, where, where I'm at and that the enemy. And one thing I've, I've told my family for years, especially my wife, when she would go shopping without me, um, besides I'd tell her, don't spend too much money. Besides that, I would tell her, always know your surroundings. Hmm. Know your surroundings. Take, take note of where you are and who's around you. All the time. Because you don't know. And we live next to Flint. And Flint, Michigan. Not a nice place. And so always know your surroundings. Know what's around you. And that's what we're being told here. And, and so why? And, and just to underline this. One last thought about this. Is he says. Uh, the, the idea of being. Uh, girding up the loins of your mind and be sober. Uh, the idea here of uh, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. It, it all begins in the mind. The enemy always attacks our thinking first. And this is why it's so important, right? He always attacks our thinking. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Scripture says in Proverbs 29, I think it is. Um, somebody might find that. But uh, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And, and it's so important. And that's why in the book of Philippians, Paul emphasizes whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are good report. Think and praiseworthy. Think upon these things. Because our thinking 
is so important, right? And everything else is going to spring from our thinking. So if we have our thinking right, the battle can be won. A quick comment. I think we were saying earlier that we expect persecution. And along that line of thinking, I believe that it is in higher education that we will see some of these difficulties. And we already are seeing it in higher education because that has an impact upon how you think. I just want to make a point here. Brother Mark's probably going to do it, but in verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Oftentimes I see at hand means it's near. And I believe that in this context, I may be speaking of judgment. We know that the Lord Jesus is exalted, and we understand he's going to come back and, and, and so on, but there's also judgment pending, hanging over this world today. There's judgment coming. Uh, we, by grace, are preserved from that. He, he took our judgment, but we know that there's judgment hanging over this world right now. So the end of all things is at hand. I think I could at least make that application that that's what you're thinking of as well. So when you look through the context of First Peter as we've been just hitting these little points, um, you'll also find that there is a real opposition when we seek to be who God calls us to be. And it's in various spheres. So for example, it talks about um, our engagement with the world, right? Um, in chapter two. Um, verse 18, or verse 17. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only the good and gentle, but also the forward. For this is thankworthy. So it, it talks about our relationships in, we would say today, in our employment, in our the spheres of our employment. In chapter 3, it talks about the spheres of relationships, um, husband and wives. What's happening in our culture today, what's happening in our world today, it is in our face mm -hmm. that man is trying to redefine what God has defined. And when we set up and say we are going to stand by God's standard and God's method of what he defines it as, well, we're going to come under fire. Mm -hmm. We see it all the time. You know, um, we, it's called cancel culture, right? We've heard that. Cancel culture, where you say something that is not normally accepted, who is authored by the prince of the power of the air, who is the one who governs this present evil age, then you become potentially the victim of cancel culture. And so living in a marital relationship that honors God, uh, women carrying themselves in a way that honors God, men living in a way that honors their wives and honors God. Um, I remember, you know, years ago, you know, being ribbed at work because I took the time to check in with my wife on a regular basis at lunch or if I was working late. And they said, what are you whipped? What is wrong with you? <laughs> you know, what's wrong with you taking, you know, no, it's caring. It's taking the standard that God gives and trying to live it out. And just inevitably, you find yourself on the outside of the present culture. And I, th and I think this is something that we want to be very cognizant of, is that the co it's all around us. I mean, you can't avoid it. You drive your car, you look up at a billboard, it's in your face. You, you watch something on the news, or you, you, you think you're watching something that's harmless and it's in your face. This mind that we're talking about, the first thing he says, therefore, be sober-minded. That means to think and be very sharp with what's happening and properly analyze it and properly figure out what's going on. It's to the idea of, of exercising self-control as well is that what proceeds from the mind is what gets produced in action. And so you have to, 
it says be sober-minded. Think clearly, think definitively, think biblically so that you can have a proper reaction when you're seeking to do what's right rather than compromise to do what's wrong to avoid the persecution you endure because you know that's what you're called to. And then we have the resource of prayer. We have the resource of prayer. And um, the Lord knows that this is going to be a, um, the ongoing conflict. And, and we've had it in our Bible study earlier that, uh, today, uh, this week, about the Lord's going away to pray, going into the mountain or the desert to pray. And so we have the exhortation to watch unto prayer. So clear thinking, uh, discerning thinking, um, uh, right thinking, and then really watching in prayer, being diligent and focused in prayer. As, as Mark was uh, talking about the cancel culture, I don't know how many of you actually know this, but the reason we're here at Messiah instead of at Grove City is for this very reason. Grove City College has changed its thinking and we are here today because we're fundamental and they are getting rid of all Bible fundamental uh, conferences. There was a huge Methodist group that, that came in, over a thousand people, uh, and they, they eliminated them and they are influenced by the critical race theory. They're influenced by, they have a new president and that new president is taking them down a path and their faculty is up in arms, their, their alumni is up in arms, their, their, the parents of the students are up in arms, but they, they've got new, new uh, professors in there. And so the very thing that Mark said about cancel culture and, and all of this uh, uh, critical race theory and, and the woke and, and all of that has come into Grove City and that's why we're here instead of there. They let us go because we're fundamental. And, and, and so we, we face this. This is very real. And, and, uh, and, and so uh, just to piggyback on what Mark just said about um, the, the resource of prayer for us, there needs to be this attitude, not only of our minds being sober, but there needs to be this attitude of ever dependent upon our Father in heaven, ever dependent upon the Lord Jesus, so that when we are entering into situations, that we're not leaning to our own understanding, but we're acknowledging Him in all of our ways, and we are allowing Him to direct our paths, right? This is what, what Scripture says. And so, how important it is when He mentions it to be watchful in prayer, you know, watchful in prayer, uh, means that you have an eye open. You don't, you know, we, we typically say, everybody close your eyes, bow your head, let's pray. Well, watchful in prayer is uh, like one guy says, I, uh, when, when we give thanks for the food, I keep my eyes open so that my brother doesn't steal my food. <laughs> and that's being watchful per, for prayer, right? In prayer. And in the same way, you and I, we live in a day when we need to, as we're dependent upon the Lord, we're looking around. We're looking circumspectly, as Scripture says. And, and so this is, I think, extremely important. It, these, are, these are military terms. And we've got to realize, uh, young people, that we're, we're, we're in combat. Mm -hmm. and, and so these are military terms that we're talking about. In chapter 3, it says they accuse your good conversation in Christ. So even the good that you're doing is going to be maligned. In chapter four, um, you're gonna be looked at as strange. And this is you know, different from what Brother Sam was talking about here. You're gonna be looked at as strange because you don't do everything that the culture is doing. He says, they're gonna think you're strange because you don't go about drinking and getting drunk and reveling and, and uh, idolatry and a whole bunch of other these immoral things that uh, mark the culture. 
And it's very interesting, you know, the, the Roman culture that, that it was in the time that this was written was pretty decadent, you know, pretty decadent. And our culture is right there, very decadent. And so the fact that we take a stand and we avoid any even appearance of that thing, what does it say in Ephesians? That it's not even named once among you. He says, then you also will be the, the um, thought strange. You'll be looked at in a very strange and different way by the world around us. And so this is, this is the time of what's going on. Now, we talked about being sober and watching unto prayer. And one of the things that really I, I, I struggle with is what, he, what follows next. What follows next is that you don't do this on your own. So often, I try to live and to function and to go it alone. I tell no one my struggle. I ask no one to pray for me. I'm intimidated by the fact that I have to say to someone, listen, pray for me, I'm, I'm struggling with this, this, or that. But if we look at this context that he's saying here, if this is the struggle of being an outcast because the world rejects you, well, where do you find that companionship, that camaraderie, that, 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 that um, community? He says you find it amongst those who are in that same situation. I tell a joke, and it's really not funny, but it's funny. Um, it's not politically correct, so I'm going to get in trouble. That's okay. But the story goes like this. The Lone Ranger and his companion, Tonto, were riding through the forest. And they got surrounded by a whole set of Native Americans to... They were going into the wrong territory. And the Lone Ranger turns to his sidekick, Tonto, and says, so Tonto, what are we going to do? And Tonto says to him, what do you mean we, Kimosabi? All right? You get it? We have made alignments and associations along the wrong lines and we have to be honest with ourselves and to realize in the face of persecution, all we have is our savior and each other. And we don't invest the time and the energy and effort in each other and building those relationships. And that is the exhortation that Peter says here. He says, so we have um, uh, being sober and being watchful unto prayer. But then immediately after that, he talks about the community. He talks about the fact that we need to be supportive and helpful one toward another. He says, first of all, and above all things, that's priority. That's priority. He says, above all things, have fervent love among yourselves. So we've gone uh, quite a while without asking for your input. But uh, we'd like to have some input here. I'm going to turn us for a moment to Romans chapter 16. But I would like, while we're turning there, uh, if others could think of some passages to support or to um, illuminate some of these things that have been mentioned about our relationships with one another and their importance. In Romans 16, um, let me mention that in Romans chapter 1, we find out that Paul had never met these Roman Christians. He said, I've really wanted to come and visit you for a whole long time, and I haven't gotten there yet, and I'm praying about coming one day. He even had a plan that he was going to go back to Jerusalem and then ultimately go to Spain, and he would pass through Rome on the way to Spain. As we know, that plan didn't develop that way. That's not how he got to Rome. But, but in Romans chapter 16, just run your eyes, start at verse 3, 
and run your eyes down the page, down to verse 15, and look at how many names are in this chapter. Some of them are people that Paul knew already. He'd worked with them. We see what he says about some of them. Um, some of them we even know, like Priscilla and Aquila in verse 3. Uh, we know from other scriptures that he, he had interacted with them personally, and now evidently they're living in Rome. But others, he just knows their names, and he knows what they're doing for the Lord. And somehow, even though he never had met some of these people, he knew what they were doing for the Lord. And he says, greet this one, and greet this one, and greet this one. This is my beloved brother. And he's, he's very well aware of a number of these who fellowships together in, in Rome. And I would just suggest that this is such a beautiful illustration of what we have in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, where he says, fervent love among yourselves. Who is it that's left out in the phrase among yourselves? It's nobody, right? And, and yet, if we think about our own interactions, you know, who, who's on the fringes? Sometimes people are on the fringes. And uh, it's really important to recognize that it's among yourselves, not among the little subset. We have little subsets of ourselves, right? But this is among yourselves. So maybe with that little comment from me, maybe there's some others, maybe other brothers in the front here, or, or, but uh, some of you, there's microphones on both sides that could be passed around. Um, if there could be some additional comments made by those who could share them, other scriptures that fit into this subject. I, I would just, uh, there's a similar list as what we have in Romans 16, and I'm not going to have us turn to it, but just you can write it down. It's interesting how Paul, uh, you know, Paul, we, we get this idea that Paul was uh, kind of a lone wolf and that he was out there by himself, and, and, but, but hardly ever do we see him by himself except when he's in prison. Uh, and all had forsaken him in Second Timothy. But almost always there's Paul and Silas or Paul and Timothy or and there was Paul and Barnabas for a while. And in Colossians chapter 4, starting at verse 10, uh, sorry, starting at verse 7, going to the end of the chapter, at the, at the close of this, it's interesting. He names name after name after name, starting with Tychicus and then going all the way down he names all these different people and, and different qualities about them and realizing and calling some of them fellow workers and fellow soldiers and fellow this and, and realizing that he was in this thing together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, so I just suggest that as another passage that goes along with this. But this idea that we have here of fervent, uh, fervent love, heated love, love that is is boiling over is the idea, I think, in the original. It has the idea of, of, of you know, like you put a, if you're boiling eggs and you've got the pot there or you're boiling water for pasta and you've got it there and it's boiling over and, and it's just, it, it's just, that's fervent. That's the kind of love that we're to have for one another. And, you know, we're living in a day, we, we, we mentioned yesterday, uh, the perilous times. And when we think about the perilous times we live in, you know what the enemy wants to do? He wants to continue to divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. And he wants us to be like the, that phrase in Galatians chapter, I think it's in Galatians chapter uh, 5, where he, he says, biting and devouring one another. Mm -hmm. And when you bite and devour, the actual word there means uh, you you you. You know, our parents have always told us, clean up your plate. Well, that's the idea here is that there's nothing left. Mm. We've been biting and devouring one another, and there's nothing left for the glory of God. It, it, we, you've just consumed one another. Instead of using one another and having fervent love for one another, we've just, we've just constantly divided and divided and divided. And 
and we've criticized and been critical and, and we just constantly beat the other person down behind their back. And that, beloved, I'm going to tell you, and I stand firm on this, we've got to stop. Mm. We've got to stop. And we've got to realize that in these last days, do you know something? You know where there's no division? There's no division amongst Christians in countries where there's persecution. There's no division in countries where there's persecution. Christians come together in persecution. But what happens is we've had it too good for too long. Mm -hmm. And and we're getting too comfortable. And so we, I I, I don't like Mark because he's wearing a white shirt today, right? I, I don't like Steve because he looked at me funny. And, and, and so we, we have our reasons. And to God, they don't make sense. To God, he doesn't accept it. Just like he looked at me funny or he's wearing a white shirt. And the Lord looks at it. Mm. And he says, he's the brother. Mm-hmm. He's your brother that I died for. And, and so... This is, this is this fervent love that we're to have. Yes, there's things that happen and there's, there's reasons for, for separation, for godly separation, yes. But for division, no. Mm. Division is of the enemy. Mm. Separation is of God. Biblical separation can be of God. Division, where we divide that's a work of the tool, the tool of the devil. So we need to be on guard. And it says this idea of having fervent love for one another. And I'm sure the brethren will build on this. But, but we just need, we've spent enough time doing the devil's business. We need to start doing the Lord's business. I just want to, I'm going to make a comment. But before I make the comment, I think we should all stand up for a minute or so. Just stand up because begin to that point where we sort of go to sleep. But I, and I can make the comment, um, if I can raise this thing up. Um, yeah. uh, I'm just going to make a quick comment on the fervent love. Um, if you go to the Believer's Bookshelf, you will see a book there by Brother Eugene Vedder. The last book he wrote, as far as I know. In there, he speaks about John, the Apostle John. If you look at the, the first chapter, he, he speaks about the fact that, that John is old. He was old, obviously towards the end of his life. And there were those who took him to the meeting, as it were. If you read it, you'll see. And all he did, all he was says was, love one another. You can read it. Just, just love one another. That's what the brother John said. Just love one another. Uh, just to, uh, I'd just like to piggyback off of what Brother uh, Tim said. Um, I, re- I Earlier today, I had a conversation with Brother John, actually. That's why I was a bit late to the, the, the meeting right now. Uh, and we were talking about this. And he, uh, he, we were talking about scriptures. And he pointed out that even though we have a lot of differences between each other and the uh, brethren, it shouldn't be a cause to cause divisions between each other. And he mentioned a scripture that was interesting where we read in Second Peter uh, about the uh, difference between Paul and Peter. And though they would rebu- rebuke each other very sharply, it didn't put it, it didn't lead to the cause of them not talking and being courteous with one another. And we see even in Second Peter that uh, Paul uh, was being revered in some way by Peter though he was rebuked sharply by, by each other and they have uh, some kind of disagreement. And we could read also the same things by many other brothers, namely uh, Paul and Barnabas, which had a, we, we spoke about it uh, yesterday, if I remember well, that uh, him and John Mark had a, uh, had a big disagreement. And yet we see that uh, they were able to continue the ministry, though they were a bit separate. And uh, to that end, uh, it's something that we could be inspired of. Uh, to use that as an example to what to do, even though we have personal differences, to put these aside and what unites us at the end. As Brother Chuck Berry said last time I was here, it's, it's, we are all we got. We, like, Christians don't make, like, the solid Christians don't make up 1% of the population. So who are we going to go to? The world? Mm-hmm. 
Peter uses a unique expression elsewhere in his book, um, in chapter 2, a verse that Mark read earlier. Uh, he mentions, um, love the brotherhood, verse 17. Mm -hmm. Love the brotherhood. And he uses that phrase again. It's not in all translations, but it's the same word um, in chapter 5, verse 9 the sufferings that are experienced by your brotherhood. Uh, it's, he's the only writer who uses that word. It's only in those two places. And it really, I think it's such a beautiful expression, the brotherhood. It's, it's a little more um, of a bond implied than just your, your brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's, it's a brotherhood. It's, it's a... Um, a it, it, there are parameters already defined, and everybody is in it. And you love the brotherhood that God has called us into. There is, there is already this brotherhood. It's, it's almost as if, um, almost as if the people individually are not in view in that expression. I don't mean that they're not important individually. But that the, what, what's, what's, what we're loving is not merely love the brothers and sisters, but love the fact that there is such an entity that God has created. All these different uh, metaphors in the scriptures of, of who we are. We're a body. We're a building. We're a temple. We're a house. But we're also a brotherhood, a, a, uh, an entity that God himself has, has formed and has said we are all part of that. And we are told here in verse 8 of our chapter, have fervent love for one another, or, uh, or another expression might be among yourselves. This is a little different than some of the one another's. But among, have fervent love among yourselves, because love will cover a multitude of sins. I just want to touch on this as well. It's a quotation. It's a, it's a quotation from the Proverbs, I think. Somebody could correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, but it's, it's not saying love ignores sin. Tim has already alluded to the fact that uh, there may need to be a time of separation. We separate from what is evil because we don't want to be uh, stained by that. We might withdraw from or exercise discipline that looks like separation from a believer, if ever it is uh, involving a fellow believer because of discipline, it's always with the intention that ultimately there will be reconciliation, there will be restoration of that relationship. We don't have any examples in the scriptures of people who said, well, I'm the Lord's and you're the Lord's, but um, we're going to stay apart forever. It's not what God has intended. It's, it's a more complex subject, I know, in, in our circumstances, and I'm not going to go farther down that road, but it's not what God intended, ever. But when we say here, love will cover a multitude of sins, it doesn't mean love ignores sin. What it means is love keeps it quiet. Love keeps it covered. Love um, moves us forward so that sin doesn't cause us to be divided. Love will address a potential rift in a relationship in a manner that will not allow that rift to become a wedge that will push believers farther and farther apart. Love will say, oh, there's something that needs to be adjusted. And I am not going to tell everybody else that that needs to be adjusted. I'm going to let the Lord use me, if that's how he uses us, to keep that in the background and address it so that then it will not become an issue. That will not become something that causes a, a, a larger rift, a larger divide. Because the, the desire of those who have fervent love among themselves is, I don't want to lose this relationship. I can't, I can't give this relationship up. I don't want to lose that. It's what God has created, the brotherhood. 
And if there really is this fervent, extended love, this extensive expression of love that reaches out, then we're going to act a certain way. And quite frankly, it won't be the way we usually act. Because usually we sort of, you know, send out feelers about a situation that we're concerned about. And we say, well, you know what? I want to find out if this guy is on my side. Um, if he is, I'm going to tell him some more. Uh, oh, I think he's not really on my side. I'm going to, you know, go somewhere else and tell my thoughts to someone else and see if I can get him on my side. And even maybe with, with what we present are the, the purest motives. You know, we're just concerned about uh, the honor of the Lord. And, and I don't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about the honor of the Lord. But if, if that's our concern, let's honor the Lord by covering a multitude of sins because we have fervent love among ourselves. Just one other, or maybe two other comments on this. In the book of Colossians, the book of Second Thessalonians, Paul, when he writes to those two assemblies, he says, I've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love one for another. That is the true mark of disciples of Christ, that we have this fervent love one for another. Okay, I'm going to be different. Um, in reality, within the body, we have different individuals, and this is a question, not a comment, different individuals with different personalities. Could, we, could you help me? How do I get along with a person whose personality is totally different to mine, and sort of, I rub them the wrong way, and they rub me the wrong way. How do you, could we comment on how can you help? Because that's the reality that we deal with. We are different people. We, have, we come from different cultures, of different backgrounds, and yet the Spirit of God wants us to, He empowers us to love each other. But I just want to hear some comments because I know for a reality fact that we have different personalities and that that causes a lot of strife within the body of Christ. I just want some comments about that. How can I deal with people who have a different personality to me and love them? F and notice to make this point, I was going to make the point. It's interesting that in John chapter 13, the Lord Jesus says, love one another. A new commandment they give unto you that you it, again, I've said this in our meeting. It wasn't like a request. I would really like you to love each other. No, it's a commandment. <laughs> love each other. But here, it's now not just love each other. It's fervent. Have fervent love. It's even another grade up. But my, my challenge to me and to us is, okay, how do I do this with people whose personalities are so different to mine and I find so difficult to get along with? Can you imagine... Being for three years with Peter. And Peter's the guy that always, I got the answer. Peter's the guy that always, you know, we, we say he put his foot in his mouth with the other foot <laughs> because that's what he always did, right? Can you imagine, Lord, if all these others, if they betray you, not me. I'm with you to the end, Lord. And Peter learned about brotherhood. And, and even, even after when, when the Lord says, Peter, I want you, do you love me? Well, yes, I love you. I, I, I like you. Yeah. And they had that whole conversation. And even after that whole conversation, he said, yeah, but what about this man? You know, there's Peter, right? Uh, to the point that was made here a minute ago. Uh, Peter was confronted by Paul in Galatians chapter 2 to his face because Paul, Peter had gone back into was sliding back into Judaism a little bit and was, was being a little bit legal and Paul confronts him but at the end of 2 Peter chapter 4 Peter calls him beloved brother mm -hmm. Paul. And, and I think that that's really important 
because he got a sense of what this brotherhood is. Beloved, not just brother, but beloved brother Paul. And so he learned to appreciate the differences. And, and he went, once he was corrected, he didn't hold, you know, Steve corrects me. And now I hold it against Steve for the rest of my life. No, that, that what Peter did is when Peter was corrected by Paul, that endeared him all the more, right? And Paul was a different kind of a guy. Paul was, and, and I think it, 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 it comes out in, in here's an example. Uh, we read in scripture in 2 Corinthians that Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 of the Lord Jesus that he knew no sin. Well, Paul was a man of intellect. Paul was a man, a scholar, really. And, and he would write of the Lord Jesus that he knew no sin. John was a man of the heart. And John would write, in him was no sin. But Peter, Peter was a man of action. And he said he did no sin. Right? And, and so in, we see the difference in, in just in that expression. Trying to ex explain how pure the Lord Jesus was. They all had their different ways of doing it. They said the same thing, but they said it differently. They said it in, in character of their own personalities, right? So just, just to uh, show us something here, back in our text, or back in the chapter, in the book anyway, in chapter 1 of First Peter, Peter writes this. And, and he's been through the mill. He's been through experiences. And now he's writing this, and he says in verse 22, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. So there's a prerequisite to, to answer Sam's question. It's obeying the truth. Through the Spirit, in sincere, unfeigned, real, not fake, not hypocritical, sincere. No cracks in it is the meaning. Love of the brethren love one another fervently with a pure heart. And then uh, in chapter 3 and verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion one another for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, mm -hmm. be courteous. And, and I think there's full of instructions in those verses. Then we come to the verses that we're at now. But yes, we're all different. But you have been redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're my brother in Christ. Because we have the same Father, and we have the same Savior, and we have the same Lord. I'd love to spend so much more time on this, but we've got at least three more points to cover, and our time is quickly going. Um, but I think this is very, very vital that we, we hit on this and, and really emphasize the importance of this. But then he says, it gives us some practical things as well. How does this love, this fervent love, manifest itself? How does it um, make itself manifest? And this is a, a challenge for us. Um, he says, use hospitality one with another. Why do you have a home? Why should you have a home? Or what should your home be used for? Hmm. We live in a society, in a culture where, you know, we, we approach this in different ways. But I, I would challenge every one of us, you know, and some of you are not in that space yet, but some are in that space where you're married and you're, you know, trying to build your family and you're trying to figure out, well, where do we live? Where do we put our tent? Where do we put our, our house? And I'm suggesting that here, if we understand the, the time that we're talking about, the time that we're living in, I need to ask myself in the house that I'm choosing, in the house that I want to live, what is my house being used for? How do I utilize my house? Is it a haven for the brethren. Hebrews tells us, be ready to entertain strangers, 
for some of entertained angels unawares that my home is now an extension of this brotherhood. It's an extension of this reality that this is, this is the community that really matters. And, and, and it's, a, it's a tough balance to strike because there's affordability questions, there's location questions, and all kinds of questions that come. But I am just suggesting that we really think if you understand the times, if we're looking for a home, that we have to also keep in mind the purpose of the home is that we share it in hospitality one with another in light of the days and the times that we're living. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna move quickly because I, I wanna get all the points in before we, we close. Then he, the last thing he says is every one of you have been given a manifestation of grace. Mm. Every last one of you has been given a manifestation of grace. God has deposited it in you, in me, not necessarily the same thing, but he's deposited something in you and in each of us so that this reality might be able to work. And he says, To each of us has been given this manifold grace and we're to be good stewards, but what's the purpose? Mm -hmm. What's the purpose that we might serve one another? Mm. Our culture, we talked about this yesterday, our culture and the way that we live and it's impacting us is that we live for ourselves. Every man you know, loves, him, loves pleasure, loves himself, loves money more than anything else. And he says here, no, God has given you a gift, given you something of his grace so that you might serve someone else. Come alongside to serve someone else. Everyone has received something from God. You've received something, I've received something, and the whole intent is that I contribute to this whole so that when the persecution is happening all out there, I find a refuge in this community and someone comes alongside and can just say, hey, hang in there, Tim. We got your back. <laughs> we got your back. I think of the, in Acts chapter four, when Peter was in prison, it says the whole assembly came together to pray for Peter. You know, they got his back. He was in the, the, the fire of persecution, being thrown into prison unjustly. And the brethren just rallied around him and said, okay, we're going to pray for Peter. And it got so exciting and so intense that Peter shows up. And, and Rhoda is so like, oh, 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 Peter's at the door. Can't be. <laughs> <laughs> we're praying for him. Yeah, <laughs> but the point is, is that they rallied. Mm -hmm. And this is really what this is suggesting is that God gives us, he deposits in each of us so that we can contribute to this community that he calls us to. I just mentioned that for hospitality, um, the, the term, it's a very interesting term. It's used in a lot of Greek literature also. Um, it, it means fond of strangers. Uh, it's got the word philos in there, that kind of love, a lover of foreigners, actually. In other words, the same word as they use for foreigners. And a lot of times, like in the Greek plays, um, somebody's just traveling and a, a traveler happens in, through a village. And he says, oh, you're, uh, you, this is our guest friend. It's related to this word we have, hospitality. This is our guest friend. Have you met him before? No, I have no idea who he is, but he's my guest. And I would just say that in the New Testament, hospitality is not one of the gifts. It's not mentioned as a spiritual gift. It's just what they did. Sometimes we talk about people having the gift of hospitality and we kind of made it a business, you know. Um, we, uh, we train people in, in hospitality. You can get a degree in hospitality um, in, in, uh, in, in your secular employment. But from the New Testament standpoint, it's just what the Christians did. They showed hospitality to one another. And, and this was, you could just imagine, in the context of what Peter is saying, where everywhere a Christian went, 
They would be reviled. They would be set aside. And we don't want this, another one of those Christians here. Uh, but there's somebody in the community who's also a Christian. You're one of us. You come on. Uh, we're going to uh, be together. We're part of the brotherhood. It must have been, you know, when Paul, um, when Paul first finally got to Rome, it says uh, in Acts chapter uh, 28, where they, they're off the ship, uh, they finally get to the port in south, south of Rome. Uh, it, they've landed the ship uh, in, the, uh, in the region of Italy, but they're not anywhere near Rome yet. They're going to travel on foot. People from Rome heard that he was coming, and they walked miles south. I forget, maybe 30 miles south, where they finally met him on the way. He'd walked north in chains. Here come some brothers and sisters from Rome, part way to meet him on the way. They heard he was on the way. And it says when he saw them, he thanked God and took courage. What is that like for Christians to see each other, just to see each other? That's, that's that atmosphere of, wow, here's another believer. I've never met you before, but amen. We, we are part of that brotherhood. One quick comment as we come to the end. I noticed that at the end of verse 9, it says, um, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Mm. Without grumbling. <laughs> so it is possible that one could be hospitable, but he could be grumbling all the time. And I just the thought comes back to my mind that Miriam, Martha, you know, and the issue of you left me to do all this work. People could be grumbling about all the work that goes into being hospitable. The, the answer is that we should not be grumbling as we do this. I just want to just very quickly follow up on what Steve said about the, the word hospitality. Uh, when I say hospitality, what word do you hear in there? Hospital, mm. right? It's a place to go to get help. Mm -hmm. And if we opened up our homes more to the brethren, we wouldn't need to go get help mm. out there. Mm. We would have the help we need right here, right? Uh, another thing uh, to think of, just to add scripture to what Steve said, more scripture to what he said, and that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, where the household of Stephanas addicted themselves. The word devoted means addicted, addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And so that, that's a household that was open for the love of the saints. And then one last thing to, to go back to, to Sam's, because I think Sam really asked an important question, how it is that, that we can deal with different personalities. The best thing I've ever found in dealing with someone that I might rub the wrong way or that might rub me the wrong way is start praying for that person. Not, not Lord, change Steve. Please change Steve. No. You're not the only one praying. <laughs> I know. I've talked to Susan. But, <laughs> but really is, Lord, help me to see something special in Brother Sam. Help me to see him the way you see him. You died for him. Mm. Help me to see him the way you see him. I want to see him through your eyes. And then start praying and thanking for the gift that he has as a teacher. And the gift that he has is this. Or the gift that he has is that, right? Start praying positive for them. And you know what happens? Uh, your heart opens up to them. You start seeing them the way God sees them. And, and you realize, okay, I might not be best buds ever with him. You know, we're not going to be BSF. But... There, there's going to be an appreciation for them, right? And then, once you get that done, here's another thing. Pray with them. Mm -hmm. When you can start praying with somebody that you're at odds with, what that does is it opens up the window into their soul. It opens up the window to what's in their heart. And, and you realize, you know what? I, got, I had him all wrong. I had them all wrong. Hmm. And, and so I want to suggest, I, I appreciate the question, and I didn't, I, I don't think we answered it well enough, but I, I just want to add that to that because I think it's so important. Hmm. Actually, I was going to come back to the question because the last point is not found in the verse that we read, but it's in verse 11 where he talks about using the gift that was given 
And then it says at the end there <clears throat> that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom be praise and dominion forever, ever. How do I get over these matter of personality things? I have to shift my perspective. It's not about my personality or his personality. It's way of saying, what's for the glory of God? Um, it's not about, um, you know, and, and we have to be so guarded against this selfish, self-oriented, super spiritualized self-actualization that we sort of embrace. The reality is, is that our lives, touched by the grace of God, has lifted us out from this world and has placed us in a kingdom of the Son of His love, where we are actually dependent and should be dependent on one another to be able to withstand what the hostilities that the world is going to, is going to throw at us. We keep the confidence and the assurance that it's only for a time. The end of all this is going to come. But in the meantime, let's keep doing this. Let's recognize the value of the community to which we're called. Let's live fervently loving one another. Let's do all things to the glory of God. Just one other quick point about differences. Whether we allow the nature of what we are naturally to impact what we have been made spiritually is where this problem comes up give you a very interesting observation. Two of Jesus' disciples, one was Matthew. What was Matthew's job? He was a tax collector. He worked for the Roman government. There was another disciple called Simon the Zealot. You know what a zealot was? That was a guy who was ready to put his life on the line to take out a Roman. So imagine these two guys called by Jesus and Simon would look at me, whoa. <laughs> he, he works for them. But when they're transformed because the light of Christ has shined on you and changed your life, you figure out a way that you work together. And I can just imagine, I don't know this, I don't have a biblical basis to make this, but it'd be interesting if the Lord sent out Simon and Matthew in the two by twos. <laughs> it would have been really something to watch. I have no biblical basis to say that, but it's just interesting that when people who come from a different worldview come under the Lordship of Christ, you can overcome them and you can work it out for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. I was at a conference one time years and years ago with uh, Brother Giddy Leviton and Brother uh, Walid Say Sayed Saad. Saad. And uh, one's a, a Jew, mm -hmm. and the other one is Palestinian. Palestinian. Mm -hmm. And there they were, and they're singing, Father, how precious unto thee is thy beloved son. Mm -hmm. And they, one of them turned around and looked at the other, and after the meeting, tears were running down both of their faces, and they just hugged up. And that's this brotherly love that, you know, how can, I just was talking to Walid about that a couple months back. I was in his home in California and, and you know, he, even there at the table, he, he, he started choking up and he was full of tears and he says, that's my brother. Amen. Well, our time is gone. Let's just close in a word of prayer.